Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of, Sustain of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, and welcome to the inaugural edition of the Top 3 podcast. In this podcast, each week we're going to take a look uh, at the week back, what happened during that week, and how it set the stage for the coming week, uh, and publish uh, this podcast on Mondays as a way of sort of assessing uh, what's in the news and, and where we're going in the uh, in the week ahead. We intend it to be short. It'll be about 15 minutes each week. We'll post it up. Uh, you can listen to it anytime during the week, and then we will replace it with another podcast uh, the following Monday. That's assuming things go to plan. This week, the top three things are uh, a brief discussion about uh, some statements by Senator Pete Kelly uh, last week at the uh, Resource Development Council meeting in Anchorage, the annual legislative, pre-legislative uh, discussion of where things are going. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about something the governor said uh, about the Alaska LNG project and uh, what, uh, what he has in mind for financing. And then we're going to wrap it up with a brief discussion about the Trump administration's decision to open up uh, various coastal areas, all of the coastal areas uh, around the United States to drilling. There's been a lot of focus in the Alaska press about what that means for Alaska, the Alaska coastal, uh, potential for Alaska coastal drilling, but we're going to put that in a broader context and, and talk about whether uh, how significant that is. Uh, for Alaska and whether it really is doing what uh, what some think it may be doing. So let's start first with uh, Pete Kelly's remarks to the uh, Resource Development Council last week. In an article by Nat Hertz uh, in the Anchorage Daily News, Senator Kelly was quoted as saying this, I don't want about the about the state's fiscal situation in the upcoming legislative session. Quote, I don't want to get to yes on a plan that takes money out of the private sector, Kelly said. My, do my goal this year is to get to know. If someone brings up taxes, I'm getting to know. The irony, close quote, the irony of that statement is that Senator Kelly and the Alaska Republicans already in the past two sessions have voted to take money out of the private sector. Cutting the PFD, according to the Institute of Social and Economic Research uh, study done last year, analyzing all of the various fiscal options, including all of the New, in, including several of the so-called new revenue options, the Institute of Social and Economic Research uh, analyzed the effect of the PFD cuts and said cutting the PFD, taking that money out of the hands of individual Alaskans, taking that money uh, out of the private sector, has the largest adverse impact, quote, largest adverse impact uh, on the overall economy and is, quote, by far, close quote, the worst alternative from the standpoint of Alaska families of all of the fiscal options. It takes money out of the private sector uh, uh, just as uh, income taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, any other uh, move of money out of the private sector into the government sector does. PFD cuts uh, have uh, the, same, the, the same consequence or the same thing. And of all of those, is the worst for the overall Alaska economy um, and for Alaska families. So the irony of Senator Kelly's statement is he says, quote, I don't want to get to yes on a plan that takes money out of the private sector, close quote, but that is the very thing that the Alaska Senate uh, and the governor and the House with them, but this is Kelly making the statement, the very thing they've done uh, for the last two years running, and uh, propose to do again this year. And they've done it in the worst possible way. Under the ICER analysis, looking at the ICER analysis, taking money out of the private sector by income taxes, or by sales taxes, or even by property taxes, would be, wor would, would be easier on the Alaska economy and on Alaska families, would be better for the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families than the way they've done it. So Senator Kelly standing up and saying, you know, I am a rock rib uh, private sector guy. I'm not going to harm the private sector. Uh, and there's nothing, I, nothing I'm going to vote for that harms the private sector is wrong. He's done exactly that. Our frustration, my frustration 
is that he's not been called out for that in the Alaska press. Uh, something that I think uh, we need to be doing, the Alaska press needs to be doing, if we're ever going to get to an answer on this fiscal situation, we need to start uh, holding our leaders accountable for when they make uh, statements that are just flat wrong. Uh, and, and force them to recognize that what they're doing has the consequence uh, on the Alaska economy uh, that, 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 you know, in one breath they say they don't want to want to take, but in the other breath has, uh, has exactly that. So let's turn now to the second thing in the top three, which is an interview the governor gave uh, in, to Elwood Bremer of the Alaska Journal of Commerce. Wide-ranging interview talking about a lot of topics uh, but at one point, the topic turned to uh, the LNG project and uh, uh, the governor's hopes for the LNG project. Elwood did a, uh, a, an excellent job of getting the governor narrowed down on the financing issue. Uh, the proposal with China is for China to, to finance essentially 75% of the $40 billion plus project and for the state to find the financing for the remaining 25% which, if it's a $40 billion dollar project, would be somewhere in the $10 billion range. If the project ends up being more expensive, uh, the 25% share would be 25% you know, of whatever the additional uh, expense was. The governor has, has at times been less than clear about where that financing would come from. There's been discussion uh, uh, from the AGDC at times about private investors uh, coming in for all or a portion of the 25% uh, stake. Uh, the governor has at times talked about the state uh, uh, retaining that all or a portion of that 25% uh, stake. The financing behind that 25% uh, interest has always been, if the state was the owner, has always been unclear. Certainly there's been a lot of speculation out in the public that the governor would look to the permanent fund uh, to be the, the financing source uh, for uh, the state's 25% share, uh, but the governor has long since denied that. In the uh, in the in the interview, however, it, the governor went off in a different tangent that I've never heard him uh, or seen him go before in terms of talking about how he would finance the 25%. And it was uh, a, a surprise to me and others when he started talking about the use of the public retirement funds, state retirement funds, the PERS and TERS funds. Now, how PERS and TERS works is there is uh, an amount uh, set aside each year, an amount taken out of the budget each year, and put into an investment fund, uh, the PERS and TERS investment fund, and that PERS and TERS investment fund is there to pay claims, to pay retirement uh, claims, retirement payments and, and health care claims and other things. When, uh, when they come due as the retiree, as people retire uh, and as they, as they go through the retirement. The state isn't on a pay-as-you-go basis. That would lump all of those payments at the end, uh, well, in the future when, when, when the retirees started collecting them. Uh, so to try to spread that out over time and make uh, uh, and, and match payments to the period uh, during which the retirees are working and building up these retirement claims, uh, the money's taken out on a on a on a annual basis and put into the re into the retirement investment fund. And then the retirement investment fund invests that money for earnings off of that money that would that help then go to pay the retirement claims when when they come due out in the future. So we have this pot of investment money uh, that's managed by the Alaska Retirement Management Board. Um, fairly substantial, about $25 billion. This is, this is the governor's quote in the article uh, after, uh, uh, after there's a discussion about how to finance the 25%. Quote, that said, the governor also noted that the state has public retirement funds of more than $25 billion that could, that could find the project to be a sound investment. Having the state invest in some fashion could take the risk out of the project and help assure other potential investors that it will be seen through indirectly helping its econ economics, according to Walker, close quote. So the governor is now focusing on the public retirement funds, the PERS and TERS, as a source of financing uh, for the Alaska LNG line. Frankly, to me, that's a, that's a very risky thing to do. Uh, you're, you're essentially uh, putting both the state's, uh, uh, the, the state, 
uh, economic interest at stake uh, betting on the uh, LNG line. Uh, the state will depend upon that for revenues to help fund help fund the budget. And now you're putting the retirement funds on top on at risk on, on the very same thing. You're not diversifying the state's risk uh, as a lot of as most investment funds and governments and and private investors try to do. You're you're lumping them uh, together on one project. The the reaction to that that I that I've heard so far uh, as I've talked to people in the public particularly retirees, is sort of one of horror uh, that the governor would put their retirement funds at risk like that. Uh, and I think that's, I think this issue is going to have a lot of legs. Uh, we're going to be talking about it more as we go forward if, in fact, the governor keeps talking about that as a source of funds. The third thing we want to touch on briefly is the president's uh, announcement or the Department of Interior's announcement uh, last week that they are going to preliminarily look at all of the uh, coastlines um, in the United States, uh, uh, Atlantic Coast, Pacific Coast, Gulf of Mexico, and Alaska, uh, and potentially opening up those up for oil and gas leasing, uh, including them as a, as a um, uh, potential source of a, a future uh, supply. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, articles in the Alaska Press about that, focusing on the potential for the industry to come back into and lease the the Alaska Arctic, and uh, and try drilling again. Uh, of course, the the uh, we have drilling going on in the Alaska Arctic right now, very small level of drilling off the in the off the North Slope uh, in Beaufort, or very small intrusion into the into the Beaufort. Uh, the big project uh, that we all remember is. The shells program, the Chuck C, and there's and the articles have mostly focused on um, uh, whether others would come in after shells failure out in the Chuck Chi to to lease and try again. I think those articles are missing uh, a big part of the story, and that is uh, whether opening the other coastal areas will drain investment away from Alaska. There's a lot of industry excitement, frankly, about opening the eastern Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico is divided into three regions, western, central, and eastern. The western and central have historically been open. Uh, that's where Gulf of Mexico productions come from. The eastern area, though, while people expect it to have or, or think it has substantial oil and gas opportunities, has been closed, has never been leased. And I think the focus of the story even in Alaska, should be on the industry's excitement about the potential of opening, particularly the eastern Gulf, but also there are areas off the both the Atlantic coast and the Pacific coast that industry in the past uh, has found to have, uh, have interest that they may want to go back into. And the concern I have is whether, whether opening up all of the coastlines in that way is going to drain attention from Alaska. Not only will it not... It, is it not likely to re-spark interest in the Alaska Arctic? Uh, but I'm concerned that it may drain investment and attention uh, away, even from onshore Alaska prospects, as industry turns its focus uh, to the opportunities in the eastern, potential opportunities in the eastern Gulf and along the Atlantic and Pacific coast. There's only a, f a, a given amount of, of oil investment out there. It goes up uh, when prices go up, so we've had some increased interest and some increased investment going on in the oil industry as a, role, as a result of the recent increase in price. Uh, but uh, there's only so much out there, uh, and Alaska is, is a, a good environment, but a challenged environment in terms of cost and in terms of permitting. Uh, and if there would be an opportunity to particularly to go into the eastern Gulf, uh, I have a concern that that the industry would would turn some of its focus to that uh, and potentially away from even onshore Alaska opportunities. So the Trump administration has done a lot of good things. They've opened up NPRA to uh, more broadly. They've the, the effort is now to focus on Anwar and potentially opening up Anwar. They've made permitting uh, easier on the North Slope. But this particular piece of it, opening up the coastal plan, opening up the coastal areas, uh, I am concerned may have a detrimental effect on Alaska. I think that's been missing in the Alaska stories. So those are the top three Alaska stories that we've been following this past week and think have legs into the coming week, have, have significance in the coming week and in future weeks beyond that, uh, that, uh, that we will be following and uh, wanted to share with you. 
Thank you for joining us on this inaugural edition of the top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we will be back uh, next and in future Mondays uh, with more uh, wrapping up what happened in the week past and talking about uh, the week ahead. Uh, in the coming up uh, next Monday, I'm sure we'll be talking about the legislative session, which will then be uh, right on the cusp about, uh, about ready to start. I'm sure there will be other statements made this week uh, about that that we will be wrapping up into, into next Monday's discussion. But for now, this is Brad Keithley uh, with Alaskans for Sustainable Budget saying thank you for joining us, uh, and we look forward uh, to talking to you.